the actual content of this talk. The talk is called the Dirty Science, Empiric Science. It's unfortunately not a perfect method, but still the best method that we've found so far. And if I say there's still beer in the fridge, then you can believe me. But if you actually look into the fridge, then that's science, because with science, you basically test hypotheses and see if these hypotheses are actually true. Okay, sounds good, but where's the problem? But psychology can cause some problems with that approach because there are a lot of um, studies that show that there is a certain effect, but if people try to replicate these studies, they get a different result. So, can we? So we actually can't try to, uh, trust the studies that are being released. However, in this talk, we will hopefully learn how you can figure out if you can actually trust a certain study or not. And please give a warm round of applause for our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this talk. I hoped I would first talk about what I can't do, which is drawing. And <laughs> no, that's a joke. But um, I would rather talk about my motivation, why I want to give this talk. And I hope... Uh, you can read what's written on the slides. And now I will read what is written in the bubble. Wow, so many people here. I'm dizzy. And if I fall over, I'm sure there will be no one who will help me. And then another person says, why? Why do you think that? Do you know the bystander effect? If there are a lot of people, then no one helps. I've read this in a study that proved this. This can't be. I was at the Congress and someone already helped me. Well, that can't be true. The study of Box and Pentra has found out that people in groups do help as much as people who are not in groups. Well, you sh as, as the saying goes, don't trust any statistics that you haven't forged yourself. And we want to talk about how empirical studies actually works and how um, what constitutes studies and what makes a study a good study and how you deal with different results and in the end we want to talk about what kind of problems there are in science in general. First of all about me, I'm Anna Klingauf, I'm a psychologist, I work in at the University of Kassel in in the section of human-machine um, interactions or systems techniques. So we do a lot with technology and the interface with humans. And to make, to keep this entertaining, um, I brought, I, I'm showing you a study where we can basically go through everything by example. And this is about facial feedback and and the hypothesis is that it's not only our faces and our facial gestures that influence our um, our emotions, but it's also the other way around. Um, and and here we want to state that smiling increases the positive attitude and. N if you don't smile, then this decreases the positive attitude. And when the study was um, released, there was first one approach that said, this is all based on cognition, this is on self-awareness. When I'm looking at myself, when I smile, then I conclude that I'm happy. And this makes me more happy. And there's another approach that is psychological, and they say that the muscles that make you smile um, are connected with the emotions. Um, and now the question is, how do you figure out which one of these two approaches or explanations is actually the right one? And 
And there's a study that um, investigated this, where they try to figure out which one of these two hypotheses or which of these two approaches or explanations is actually true. And, and as I said previously, trust is something different than understanding. If I say, yes, you can um, trust empirical studies, but then we don't win anything. But if we actually understand the studies, then we have a better under estimation and better understanding of if we should trust these studies. And to clarify, I only want to focus on quantitative research here. And that means testing a hypothesis that we already have. But there's also other approaches like qualitative research, where people first develop hypotheses. So what do we need to do empirical research? First of all, we need a hypothesis. For instance, smiling increases positive emotions. And how does the experiment work, or how could an, how could an experiment work? So, first of all, we have to find some study participants and we have to manipulate them. That sounds bad, but it's not bad. It's just a, a regular, term, regular term that we um, make sure the people do what they need to do for the study. And in this case, it, it's smiling or not smiling. And then we have to measure um, the effect of the manipulation and don't worry there are no uh, formulas in the slides and in the end of course you have to use statistics to compare study populations and in the ideal world we would of course test all people so we would need to take everyone on this planet to make our test of course this is not realistic and that's why we need to have a huge sample from the population that should ideally be representative of the entire human population. Um, and the sample should really be representative of everyone we're interested in. So you should have young people, old people, men and women. And this is all not always realistic or not always feasible to achieve. And that's why you, you basically have to make assess yourself if it's still reasonable, reasonable to perform the study if you don't have ideal um, study populations. And I have to make some assumptions if this study would still work with an unideal um, study population. And it's also important to consider that we're doing a random sample. So if I have 100,000 people and I only pick 10, then there is a certain influence by this random pick. And it depends on where within the population or with, where within the distribution I sample people for my study, I will get different results. And in this study, we had 92 students that participated. And um, here we wanted to investigate the effect if smiling is really causal for the effect. And it's really important that everything else is the same. Because if there is anything else that is different between the groups, then these differences could be causal for whatever we observe. And, and it's also important that you don't directly instruct people to smile, because this could influence people to think about their actions, but we would rather have them do it implicitly or intuitively so that we don't have, so that study participants don't fully understand why they're doing certain things. And, and of course, how do you trick 
people. And one way is to say, okay, let people just have a pencil in their mouth. And um, so for those in the audience, if you want to participate, you can take a pencil between your teeth and then you can try to move your uh, move the corners of your mouth. And if you take the pencil through your lips, then you will s notice that your muscles will be affected. And you can't smile anymore. Um, and this is a way to get them to, to get the people to smile or not smile without telling them. And the good thing is that with this manipulation we can sort of find out which of the two theories works because because cognitive theory can't be can't be used here because when you think of why am I smiling right now your idea would be not because I'm happy but because I have this pen in my mouth so if people still are more happy if they have this smiling muscle construct contraction, then it's definitely the muscles that are related to their um, to their mood. So now we have to measure. So one thing that's very important here in psychology that is always problematic, because most of the things we want to measure, you can't measure them directly. You can't measure emotions different to chemistry or something like that, you can't actually measure it directly. Usually by asking them or by questioning them. And to make it comparable between two different people, there's a scale. How happy are you on a scale from 1 to 10, for example? And because our hypothesis is that emotions are hate heightened, we need to make them happy before so they were able. To, so in this study, they watched a funny cartoon. Of course, we tested the car, the study tested the cartoon whether it's actually funny. And one um, term that I that is often needed is operationalization. That is, I make things measurable. I make it th so that I can measure things that are not measurable directly. And using this questionnaire is one way of make one way of operationalization. And important is that measuring is always inexact. Every sort of measurement that you can do um, even the way you think it should be exact with um, measuring like the length of your table, you still have a little bit of a difference. So there is always something inexact about them. And this is, um, this is even more pressing when I can't measure what I actually try to measure, but instead I have to operationalize it. So this makes it more... Um, more random mistakes. Now, let me summarize the mistakes so that everyone understands. So, um, trial subjects were invited. They should hold a pen either in their lips, between their lips or between their teeth or in their hands. The hand is basically the control group, which shouldn't have, a di which shouldn't have an influence at all. Then they should watch a cartoon and all of them watch the same cartoon, and then they should sort of guess what is the better, or like, what is my mood right now? And we had to tell them a cover story, and we uh, told them, well, it's for the disabled people. How does um, writing with your mouth make, or like, influence your emotions? Now, methods, comparison. And this is important to me. Now we don't have you, you don't have to actually be able to calculate the statistics here, but you have to be able to understand how such a statistics works. And what we want to do is compare the two groups. In particular, we want to compare how funny did they find the cartoon and how happy did it make them. And because we had more than one person, we used the average of each group. Now, can I compare the, this directly? Can I say, 
well, those that held it between the teeth had a higher average. This is how I, I basically confirmed my hypothesis. But this is too easy. I can't do that. Why? Because there's these random errors. First of all, those that come through measuring. And second of all, those that come through sampling. Because I haven't asked everyone but I've only asked a sample, and then there's, I have two different um, random influences. And now I have two values, and I want to find out, are they different in a real way? Is it just random that they're different, or is it real? So this was the original table from the study, and mean funniness were the averages that were compared. Now we have to basically choose a statistical um, method and there's a lot of different um, statistical methods that are useful for some users. The most um, well known is the t-test, which is basically a way to compare two, two medians or two um, two medians, yes, um, but that doesn't work because we have more than two groups. So this is why we do, did a variance analysis, which allows us to compare more than two groups. Um, and this, the, the way of thing that we used was um, planned contrasts. So I can choose what kind of, um, what kind of pattern do I expect, and then I can choose whether it works or doesn't. So I'm hoping to be able to explain it to you now a little bit. The basic question is, do the values that I have differ from each other in a real way or just randomly? So how probable is it that I'll get this pattern by, by chance? Now, I made this uh, graph, and you can see the three groups. They seem to be different. Now, the question is, is it random or not? Now, what I can do is I can calculate the variance. The variance is the difference between each of the, um, each of the values to their mean, to the group mean. And then you basically use a formula. It doesn't matter how the formula looks, but then... Um, and then you get a value. And this is what we call within-group variance. On, and what we do next is we do this for each group or each cluster and then we compare the middle uh, the, the mean values of the different groups and then we can calculate another variance to calculate the difference between the different groups and these two variances I can put in a relation to each other and and see if the variance within one group is really huge so that there's a great diversity within one group. And I can also say that, can state whether the differences between different groups is huge or small. So is there a huge difference between the teeth and the lips groups? And if I look at the relationships between, or the relations between these groups, I can determine by using a table or by using a statistical procedure if the observed result is by chance or is actually a meaningful result from a statistical standpoint. And the most crucial thing is that you basically compare how, how, random, last, how random does my result look. So for the planned contrast, if I had, um, so if I see, okay, there's an elevated level for the teeth, a um, lower level for the lips, that's what I would have wait, that's what I would expect. And then I can compare my expectations with what is actually observed. So you want to see how likely is it that something is just by chance. And of course, 100% certainty is an unrealistic um, objective or aim for what we're doing here. But usually we say, okay, if something 
is only about 5% likely or 1% likely to have occurred by chance, then we say, okay, it's really unlikely that this just happens by chance. There might be some effect. And we call this probability for, um, for saying this is just by chance. We call this P. So this is the P value. And we see that this value is so unlikely, it's like f less than 5%. Then we say, okay, it is significant. And we see in this specific study, we have a p-value of 0.03. So it's 3%, and it's really unlikely that this happened just by chance. And therefore, we can be more confident in saying that there is probably a statistical connection. So what can we do with the results? So we see, okay, the test is significant. We see this is most likely not random. And we see that the difference that we observe is most likely caused by the manipulation that we have done. And because we did not... Um, Um, so, because we didn't do any cognitive um, processing, um, it's more likely that the physiological theory is more likely. So, the body and not the mind theory is more likely. But this is still not a, b a proof in the sense of a mathematical proof. It's just a support for the hypothesis. Because this proof can still be disproven, or this result can still be disproven by other more more elaborate um, pro proofs or hypo uh, statistical experiments. Um, so now, of course, we want to talk about how can you trust statistical, um, uh, how can you trust empirical studies? So how does empirical study work in principle? And what makes a good uh, clinical, uh, what makes a good study? Okay. Um, so, what do we have to keep in mind? We have to have standardized tests so that it's all established and it has been tested by other people. And uh, what I really appreciate is when I get an explanation why people use certain procedures to test. Um, so, when they explain why they chose specific tests. And I can really understand why certain decisions have been made. And um, and so something else that is also very important is or very helpful is when there's a manipulation check to make sure that people are actually smiling with the pencil in their mouth if the methods that were applied actually achieved what was intended to be achieved. And it's also helpful to compare this to other studies or compare methods of other studies and see what, what kind of approaches they use. And something that's also very important is that you have a good sample. So usually, as a rule of thumb, you want to have like 30 people from a group, which is, of, of course, not always possible, but... This is something you should strive for. And a, common, and a reoccurring problem is that most studies just use students as a sample because they are more available for those studies. This can be a problem when you... And this can be a problem when you want to measure things like political opinions. Then students have a different political background than the general population. This is something that you really have to be aware of and if you but if you look into something like smiling then this is most likely not a problem and it's also important to see if people ha if the experimenters have tested if the students have or the participants have understood what the study was about because you wanted to trick them into believing something else and of course you want to have a proper statistics, you need to have the right statistical procedures. For instance, if you do a lot of 
small tests, then this is not good because you have a greater number of um, false positives. Because you always say like 5% for each test, but all these 5% five five add up. And this, this is why the probability for wrongfully saying that something is significant when it is not increases. And unfortunately, it's quite difficult to understand and uh, if the statistical procedure is the right one for a particular experiment or for a particular study. And usually what you can do still is look at what kind of things are being reported, what kind of metrics are being used. And correlations and causality, I guess most of you know this. So you have to look at what kind of conclusions are being drawn. So a correlation is just a relationship between two things. But a causality is a directional relationship where you say A modifies or influences B. And so if you, for instance, see that stalks and babies co-occur, then you might conclude that there is a relationship, but if you actually do the experiments, you will see, okay, this is nonsense, of course. And, and it's really, really important that you look at what kind of conclusions are actually allowed to be drawn. And if, if there's like a temporal uh, relationship that is exactly the other way around, then of course, B can't change A. Okay, one hint, something that you want to look at is, is if it's, to figure out whether a study is good or not. Most um, studies are actually published in journals, and journals have peer reviews. And peer review means other, other researchers are actually kind of reviewing the, the research, the study that was submitted to this journal. But of course, this is not uncontroversial because sometimes there are some researchers that kind of give better or worse results to specific people. But in general, if it's a, if it's a journal that does not have peer review, that's a bad sign. Similar impact factor. is basically the impact factor belongs to a journal and it basically says how often is have studies from this journal been cited. This can be seen as a criterion of quality, but you really can't. But it's really important not to overstate the importance. Um, the idea is the more well known a journal is, the more choices it gets because more people will submit their papers, and then it will choose better, better studies. But again. That doesn't mean all studies with a high, in journals with a high impact factor are great, but it's still a good hint for you. So if you found a study that you found very interesting or something, you can see an impact factor. So everything with an impact factor of one, um, you can cite. What about, okay. So I tried showing you what is a good study, study, but now I want to ask, what do I make when I have different results? What do I do? Especially if the results are completely um, opposite to each other. Now I'm going to go back to the bystander effect example. And this was in the comic and it said, as m the more people are watching an accident, the less people actually help. Um, the, bi the basis is a case of Kitty Genovese, who was murdered. And there were about 40 neighbors that heard her crying out and that basically knew what was happening. And um, none of them actually did anything about it. So then John M. Darley, he thought, well, I really want to figure this out. So he did a couple of experiments. He basically simulated an accident and then um, varied how many people were watching. And then he measured how long would it take them to help. 
And this effect was actually found quite often, and it's been discussed a lot because it, it's pretty scary for everyone. But there's a lot of different, stu different results. So some studies found this and some studies didn't. And what are we doing? So first, let's look at it more um, exactly. Uh, sometimes when um, studies look like they're opposite, there's just differences in the design um, that make the that explain the results. The the differences sometimes only seem opposite. For example, sometimes the samples are different. If you use children versus example versus adults, it's possible that um, there isn't one study that's wrong, but instead kids and adults are just different. Or you can look at the operationalization. So uh, how did it look? Were there more, more trial people or like people um, that were not in on the experiment? Or was only one person not in on the experiment and everyone else was in? This can be a difference. So what can we actually do? We can do a meta-analysis or a moderator analysis. This, these are analysis that basically try to find out does it make a difference if it's children or adults about meta-analysis now. These are basically um, summaries of more than one study in a journal article. Now, usually th the author of this meta-analysis um, reads a lot, a lot of studies and, does, uh, and tries to read all of the studies to a specific topic in between a time frame. And then he or she will put them in an article, in a journal paper. And then he will also describe the differences and um, try to calculate the um, power of effects. So um, these effect, power of effects is basically trying to say how how much are these are these two samples actually different? Um, so uh, these power of effects are basically a measure of how large an effect is, and they're standardized. So they can be compared between different studies. If I look at um, the mean, then one person might have used a different scale, so I might not be able to compare them, but I can always compare the effect size. Um, one example of that is Cohen's D, and there's kind of um, a rule of thumb. So a small thumb would be 0.2, a medium effect would be like 0.5, and starting at 0.8, you would we would basically talk about a large effect size. So and. If you look at the effect size, then you see or you better understand how impactful the um, influence actually is or how you could better understand what kind of question was asked. And I found a meta-analysis of this bystander effect and you see that this is actually quite a lot um, offers because these literature reviews are very... Uh, take a, take up a lot of work, and you you're encouraged to look into the study because it's actually very interesting. Because they also talk about um, contradictions and uh, make it more easier to understand what the results actually mean. Then there are also reviews, which are also papers that also try to summarize the current knowledge or the current theories and hypotheses in. A research area and usually it's from researchers f that work in that field and they also try to talk about contradictions based on w w based on the knowledge that the authors have and and um, people try to also explain why there are contradictions in different studies in these reviews and that and these are the 
pieces of advice that I give you to basically better judge scientific results and scientific publications. And in the end, I would like to talk about what kind of problems um, the science or uh, the scientists have. And I don't want to show you just the positive side of science because there are more problems in science and then shown here than these three problems that I go, I'm going to talk about, but um, these are very important. So first of all, I want to talk about p-hacking, uh, replication, the replication crisis and the publication bias. So what is p-hacking? It means that you manipulate your data to obtain the desired result. The, the aim is that you decrease the p-value below 5% to obtain significant results and so that you obtain a significant result and this way you still opt you still basically trick the test to still say okay what you found out is statistically significant and the bad thing is this is really hard to detect for other people and only very few authors publish their raw data and even then, if you have the raw data, it's not always possible to replicate all the work that people have done to obtain the results. And there are different approaches to deal with this. One is replication studies. For instance, I look at one study and I try to replicate it and see if I get the same results, which, of course, is not always... Uh, and this way you can basically... Um, reveal p-value hacking. But even if you find something different, it might not be intentional that the author has done anything bad. It might have been that there's a mistake and you have to contact the original author and talk about why you get different results. And this is just an approach. This does not... So these replication studies, it's, they're just an an approach, they do not solve the problem itself. Um, and then there's also this replication crisis, which is kind of strange because I just talked about replication as a method to basically combat p-value hacking. Um, but there was an actual crisis in the field of psychology that m a lot of scientific studies in the field of psychology and some of them were very important and well recognized could not be reproduced by others and what are the approaches to deal with this and the only real real strategy is to have a better plan for the study to reduce um, the, the number of potential bad influences and do a thorough planning in advance. And sometimes it also makes sense to change the significance threshold. So I talked about having a threshold of 5% of 1%, but sometimes it makes sense to reduce it even lower to make it less likely to get a false positive. But even this problem is still not uh, resolved or solved. The last problem I want to talk about is publication bias. And the problem is that um, significance results tend to be more published than non-significant results. So if you don't find anything new or anything significant, it's unlikely that papers will be able to publish in journals. And if you basically have this bias of most publications that only show positive results, then you can get a different, res a different impression on what is happening in the field. If you knew more about... Um, okay, so another approach is meta-analysis. So you do research on existing studies and try to do correction uh, corrections on the calculations to account for different um, to account for different factors including potentially non-published studies that had 
no results, uh, no significant results. And when I create a meta-analysis, I also call different authors and different researchers who, who might have studies on the topic, but that were not uh, published. And the more I do this, and the more responses I get, the better I can assess and estimate how many non-reported effects there are, how many non-significant results have been observed that did not make it into a publication. And still, this problem is not resolved. Um, now, there are, uh, of course, I would like, so I hope that I have answered the questions further, so the last, uh, the last couple of questions answered, but still, the, the one big question remains, can we trust clinical studies? And the conclusion is that, yeah, somewhat you can do that, but it depends. So different studies have different levels of quality. And uh, it's very important that you assess the study quality yourself. And that does not mean that everyone should be a scientist, but it's worthwhile to... Um, to, to not only use the summary from popular, popular science articles, um, if, you, if you want to use this in a conversation, but it's also reasonable to really go back to the source and try to look at the original publications and try to get an idea of your own by going to the original sources. And it's really, really important that you understand probabilities and that's why I included this method part in the beginning. So, because many people say, okay, a study found out that something is like this, so it must be true. But this is a common misconception because in the end, this is all probabilities. And this is all about being certain about some things. So, and there are, most study, or basically no study is like 100% certain. And then, of course, there are meta-analysis um, that can basically give you a better overview over what has been published, in, which also applies to the reviews. And, of course, we still have these open problems in science and scientific work. And this is something that you should not disregard or ignore. And, well, the conclusion is really, like said in the beginning, science, as it is right now, is what we is the best what we have right now, but it's not perfect, and it's important to stay critical. And right now, it is so. Studies are the best thing we have, and but we should still be critical. Kleiner Kommentar vielleicht zum Abschluss. Small comment, maybe. So it's the end, even um, also looking at locked up science, all the studies that I cited here are freely available, op on the, open on the internet, and you can actually watch them if you, read them if you want. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have time for questions. Please go to the microphones and I will try to coordinate the questions. But first of all, let's ask the internet. Where is the internet? Nothing from the internet. Ja, hallo. Now um, let's start here. Hi. Irrtumswahrscheinlichkeit. So, um, du hast gesagt, es ist mal auf 1%, mal auf 5% festgesetzt. In der vorgestellten Studie habt ihr 3% gesagt. Mir Now, ist immer noch nicht ganz klar, wo der Wert denn nun eigentlich herkommt. Macht ihr die Studien, macht eure Statistiken, eure Wahrscheinlichkeiten, Berechnungen und am Ende is, guckt jemand auf does, und sagt, ha, jetzt haben wir hier P0,4, wir wollten aber 0,3, also sind wir nicht, äh, 0,03, also sind wir nicht signifikant. Oder sagen wir, okay, mit 5 kommen wir auch durch, dann haben wir jetzt 4%, also sind wir signifikant. Oder landen wir am Ende bei P-Hacking und sagen, okay, wo muss ich hin, damit ich signifikant bin, so auch wenn es 20 Prozent sind. To, um, uh, wo kommt das P her? Where does the P come from? Okay, so I didn't explain this exactly enough. It's important that before doing the study, 
on which significance level do you want to work? Do I want to achieve 5%? Do I want to achieve 1%? And then this is my aim. And then I use the statistical methods and I get a value. And this might be like 3%. And if I say I want to be below 5% and I observe 3%, then yeah, everything is fine. I have a significant result. And if I had said 1% and I observe 3%, then, well, unfortunately, it's not significant. And that's exactly what I say. If you say, if you set higher aims, and that means lower significance thresholds, then you can be more gesagt, nicht, uh, confident. Weiß, uh, wo dieses, This wo doesn't really answer my question, because ja von den where does the p-value come from? Is it dependent on the statistics? Or is this my p-value? Well, yeah, exactly. 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 This is what you calculate. You compare the one variance with the other, and you get one value, and you see And you look up in a table if that value is um, significant or not. Unfortunately, this is too complicated to explain in detail how the calculations are being done. Um, I recommend that you look into a statistical handbook to see how these calculations are being done. Okay, so we'll continue with Mike Ford. Is it conceivable that the different eine, eine uh, parts Studie of a study Leute verteilt, um, um, so is being distributed across several people so that you have a meta-study within one study and so that some people just do one part of the work and other people do other parts of the work. That's possible and that that's happening sometimes. So most of the time it's not the researcher himself that are actually that is actually doing the study with the trial persons instead of it's the assistants and also it's and also um, you can give it to different people to do the statistical analysis you could probably do that and I've seen it often that you ask someone to check your results and I'm guessing your idea would be possible but it might be a lot of work ja, da, danke für den sehr Thank übersichtlichen you for Vortrag. This really nice ich talk. Um, finde, ein weiteres Problem ist, dass Menschen, die außerhalb der Wissenschaft stehen oder außerhalb der Fachdisziplin, die Ergebnisse von Studien nicht direkt äh, aus den Studien bekommen. Also sie lesen nicht die Papers, sondern die lesen im Internet oder in einer Zeitung. Das haben Journalisten geschrieben. Und die Journalisten wiederum haben ihre Informationen auch nicht aus der Studie, sondern die haben das von der Marketingabteilung der Universität. Und The original source. They sometimes have it from the marketing department of um, the universities, and there are sometimes really weird reporting, weird results that really warp the original results. And yeah, that was more or less sort of my approach to encourage you, to encourage the people to look at the original studies and to look at them themselves even though many of them are kind of off-putting to many people? Gibt es die Möglichkeit, irgendwie uh, so Details zur Studienplanung im Vorfeld schon irgendwie bei einer dritten... Are there also possibilities to look at details of the study planning and to basically so publish them sagen, before ah, you do your study? So that um, als, uh, you can't als, also basically a commitment by um, researchers because we had said P at 0.1, but um, we actually got 0.3. Yes, it's possible and it's actually gaining more adoptions. So that a lot of papers actually say they, uh, actually a lot of journals say, okay, before doing the study, you actually have to send in an abstract and then you have have to make sure in advance of, that you commit to a specific plan and to a specific uh, threshold. And I think this is a very reasonable thing, but it's not done enough at the moment. Die eins, bitte. Hi. Ähm, Hi. Ich will noch mal kurz auf die Signifikanzniveaus so eingehen. Um, und das Erreichen levels. der Signifikanzniveaus an sich ist ja 
kein Merkmal für Qualität so, einer Studie, richtig, level, sondern nur die Interpretation dessen. Is not really something that shows quality, but instead it's just a manifestation. Yes, that is correct. So if if the results are significant, it doesn't tell you if the study is good or bad or qualitative of high quality. And some, but there are also studies that are good because they found it found uh, dis so they are good despite finding no significant results. Ja, danke schön. Thank you. Um, erstmal vielen Dank für den schönen Vortrag. Thank you for this nice nach talk. Boah, Latenz ist ja echt fies. Okay. Um, ich hätte eine Nachfrage zu Publication Bias. Regarding publication Wir haben in vielen bias. Wissenschaften das in many Problem, sciences, dass viel veröffentlicht werden muss, um that you überhaupt need to an eine Stelle ranzukommen. Wie wird da speziell in der get a position, ja, to get a job. Philosophie, wollte ich schon sagen, in so der Psychologie mit umgegangen, wenn eh schon ein Problem with that, mit Publication Bias you already have a problem with besteht. Publication Bias. Yeah, how do people deal with it? Well, you still need to publish to have a good scientific career. And I don't know of any good approach to deal with this. It's really unfortunately that uh, scientific studies that find something significant are more likely to be published. If I knew a solution to this problem, I would be very happy. I'm sorry that I can't offer a solution. Vielen Dank für den schönen Überblick. Thank you for um, this nice overview. Für mich persönlich war der letzte Teil am interessantesten for me, eigentlich. Und ich wollte fragen, ob du nochmal darauf eingehen kannst, interesting. wie diese drei Probleme And eigentlich alle zusammenhängen, weil das wirkt ja jetzt so, als wären das so drei three Dinge, die man im Hinterkopf halten together. sollte, aber eigentlich irgendwie auch gar nicht so schön, sondern man weiß, like dass sie gibt. Aber die haben einen riesigen Einfluss darauf, wie in actuality, alles in der Wissenschaft aussieht und die hängen ja auch miteinander zusammen. Und auch gerade diese Impact, die wir haben und der ist ja irgendwie auch ein Auslöser für diese and problems the fixation darauf yes so of course there is a connection between these three problems p hacking is p hacking can be reduced by replication and then of course replications there are problems and and of course we can talk for a long time about this and i can also recommend the other Uh, talks about replication paper, uh, replication bias that are currently running or currently being presented. Um, but I, I didn't understand what I should say to the publication bias. Wie zum Beispiel P-Hacking eben mit dem Bias zusammen. So also how is P-Hacking related to the publication bias? Fokussiert kommt es eben zu P-Hacking und so das because mit dem Impact Factor zusammen. You have to publish studies. You do P-Hacking. Absolutely, that already answers the questions. Um, if only studies are being published that have a significant effect, then of course people are, uh, scientists are much more incentivized to change the data and to induce p hacking and to create p hacking to have publications. But the problem is that publication bias to resolve this is really, really difficult because we as We as scientists, um, because as a scientist, we are also not that interested in reading in journals that we have, that are so many things that don't have any significant relationship. It's now 12.23, the internet woke up and has a question. So uh, how do you deal with um, errors that you can only see after you've published it as an author? So... In the ideal case, you should um, state that something was wrong and, of course, do another follow-up study to see, see if this incorrect uh, measurement or whatever has actually a negative effect on the results. Um, so far, I haven't experienced this myself and I haven't seen this for other people.
Ja, danke auch von mir nochmal für den okay. Vortrag. Ähm, ich würde nochmal kurz auf die Herausforderungen eingehen. Du hast da ganz zum Schluss gesagt, es fehlen die Daten und äh, Replikationen können teilweise nicht erstellt werden. Gibt es da Ansätze, dass zum Beispiel Journals existieren, die die Veröffentlichung der Daten erfordern und die vielleicht auch erfordern, dass eine Studie nicht nur einmal durchgeführt wird, bevor sie veröffentlicht wird, sondern dass sie zweimal durchgeführt wird? So I'm not aware of any requirements to do a certain studies twice, but there are some scientists who by themselves want to publish their data but, and um, they publish the data in the internet. But I'm not aware of any journals that really require um, that the data has to be published. But my impression is really that it's the scientists who want to publish and who want to support science as a whole with publishing the data. Hello, is um, the Tatsache, dass I, man gerne einen falschen Untersuchungsgegenstand angibt, äh, schon mal aufgefallen? Kann man das irgendwie have you seen that people like to um, basically offer a wrong topic? So you're actually um, Ja, wie du gesagt hast, zum Beispiel, dass man sagt, um, es geht um uh, körperbehinderte Menschen, die For mit dem Mund schreiben. Oh. For example, it's about so, disabled people, but instead it's yeah. about um, Weil, um, laughing. Man würde ja meinen, so, dass um, example, mittlerweile sehr viele Leute auch denken, dass in der Psychologie, wenn you du zu einer Studie that gehst, dass tatsächlich um was gut ist. In psychology, that many people would think that you actually don't lie to them. No, I don't think that there are anything like... I mean, so these cover stories during the study, so you want to um, delude the study participants about what the study is actually about while the study is ongoing. But in the end, you will tell them um, what the study is actually about. And um, it's also, and also in some studies, the researchers actually ask the people if they can guess what was actually tested. And if people realize what's actually going on, then it might be reasonable to leave these people out because the understanding of the tests um, can influence uh, the results. There's, There's um, a question. Could you please say something about funding bias? So basically, who gets the funding and how it influences research? Yeah, that's a big topic for research. Unfortunately, I cannot say so much simply because because I was only at the university and and I didn't have to deal with specific donors of money because my research so far has been completely funded by the government. Yeah, also my frage wäre Okay, gibt, es, gibt es vielleicht sowas schon oder könnte man das nicht machen? Ein Bewertungssystem für Studien, so nach dem Motto, dass für alle transparent ist, okay, mit dieser like Studie haben sich schon diese und jenen Wissenschaftler beschäftigt so that, um, und die vergeben zum Beispiel in Kategorien irgendwie Noten oder so und am Ende um, gibt es dann ein System, wo man sagen kann, okay, also die Studie ist zumindest so belastbar, so dass schon that viele that Leute sich damit beschäftigt say, oh, well, haben und attestieren konnten, das ist zumindest handwerklich korrekt gemacht und and seen that it was done right. Yes, there is something. And you can look at, at the citation count. If a lot of people have cited the study, then hopefully everyone has read the study and you can somehow conclude that um, the study is probably good. But the pr so if you would establish a rating system, then how would you agree on what kind of ratings to give to papers? It's like very subjective. And so, of course, we have the peer review and it goes in the, into the general direction. But I don't think that a rating system is something that you can objectively set up. And this is the last question now. 
Hey, kurz, kurze Nachfrage zum Thema Short der Metastudien. Regarding Gibt Meta es eine Einschätzung, studies? wie viele Studien idealerweise zusammengefasst sein so, müssen, um eine, eine how many studies Metastudie should you zu fahren? Also ich frage deshalb, man stolpert teilweise über hunderte von, von Teilstudien in Metastudien. Meta ich weiß nicht, example, die sollten da die Alarmglocken angeben oder ist das eher so ein Qualitätsmerkmal? Is that good or bad? It, de it depends on the field. If the research field is relatively new, then of course there are not many studies and you cannot use <laughs> many studies for your meta-studies. Um, but the bystander effect is something that has been researched a lot. Then of course I expect a lot of studies to be part of the meta-study. So I don't think there's a general guideline that you can use to say how many studies there should be. I would rather focus on how did they select the studies for the meta-study Did they call the authors? What kind of search terms did they use? And in these meta-analysis, they usually state this, what kind of strategies they use to find studies to, so that I can see for myself or I can assess for myself if they actually use the valid strategy or a forest strategy to find everything that I deem relevant. Okay, and now this...